Hello, welcome to the Learning Management Initiative by Department of Collegiate and Technical Education. My name is Poojita and I'll be handling Unit 2 of Green Computing. So when we um, talk about the word green computing, it consists of both hardware as well as software. It is not only hardware in the form of uh, e-waste that contributes to environmental hazards, but also software that plays an important role in increasing the power consumption of a device. For example, let's take a smartphone. When you're buying a smartphone, an important consideration is to ensure that a complete charge will last you at least a day. So we're looking at 24 hours. Um, this is not going to be possible if you're going to run software or application programs which are ill-designed because ill-designed software can lead to faster draining of your battery life. So in this session, we are going to concentrate on energy saving software techniques uh, especially on data efficiency. Um, whenever you design a software, you want to ensure that your software consumes uh, less power, thereby increasing energy efficiency, thereby guaranteeing the user more battery life. So when we talk about data efficiency, an efficient data, it reduces energy costs by minimizing data movement. When we say minimizing data movement, uh, we talk about the access to and fro from the main memory. We all know that data and instructions are stored in the main memory and when the CPU has to execute any process, it has to fetch these data and the uh, instructions from the memory, uh, process it and then it puts the output or the result back into the main memory. This is exactly the movement that we need to minimize and data efficiency basically deals with that. Now, this can be achieved in three ways. The first is to develop algorithms that minimize the data movement, that minimize this constant to and fro movement of data from the main memory to the CPU. You can design algorithms that minimize that or you could keep the data and the instructions close uh, together in the form of memory hierarchies. So the constant fetching and returning is reduced. The third way to do it is to use cache memories. You know these cache memories are temporary memories and faster memories than your main memory that basically store data for a temporary amount of time so that it can be retrieved faster by the CPU. Okay, so this cache memories is, are essentially placed between your CPU and your main memory and it helps the CPU to uh, extract data and um, instructions faster. Now, there are two methods to achieve data efficiency. Okay, the first one is managing disk input and output and the second one is by prefetching and caching. In today's session, we will be concentrating on managing disk input and output. You need to understand that in order to develop energy efficient applications or programs as future uh, software engineers, you need to understand how energy is consumed by the software that you actually develop. Now, before we move on to managing disk input and output, let's understand how the hard disk works. So what you see in the first part is the hard disk that is present in a standard personal computer. Uh, it's basically inside an aluminium casing. Once you open up that casing, uh, it reveals the second diagram. So here you can see three important parts. One is the head arm, the second is the disc platter and the third one is the read and the write head. Now this head arm, it provides for the mechanical movement of the read and the write head. Okay, the disc platter is nothing but memory for storing all your instructions and data. More the amount of, uh, more the number of disk platters, then more the amount of memory. You can see that the disk platters are arranged one above the other. So if you want more memory, then you need to basically increase the disks in the disk platter. Now each disk is made up of concentric circles, which are called as tracks and those pie shaped wedges that are represented in the blue color, which are known as sectors. This is how your memory is basically stored on a disk. Now, 
<clears throat> whenever uh, the data, the instruction has to be read, it has to come under the read write head. And then the head arm is used to basically read that particular data or write that particular data into that particular memory location. Now, the performance of any hard disk depends upon four important factors. The first one is the rotational speed. The second is the seek time. The third is the rotational latency. And the fourth one is the transfer rate. Now, the rotational speed is the speed uh, that is measured in RPM, which is known as revolutions per minute. So today you have hard disk with rotational speed of 10,000 and above. So higher the rotational speed, greater is the data transfer rate. So if it is 10,000 RPM, then uh, so much amount of data is basically transferred. So higher is the data transfer rate. The next is the seek time. It is the time that is taken by the read and the write head to read the desired track from its current position. Um, so uh, you I told you for the data to be read or written, the read and the write head should be placed above the desired position. So it is the seek time is the amount of time it takes the read and the write head to reach that particular track where the data is stored from its current position. Now, next rotational latency is the time taken by the sector to come under the read and the write head. Now, the transfer rate is the amount of uh, data that is transferred to and fro from the memory in unit time. Now, the entire performance of the hard disk also depends upon where exactly the data is on the drive, which means what is the physical location of the data on the drive. So, all these characteristics determine the performance of the hard disk drives. Now, our, uh, what we need to understand is we need to minimize data movement. We need to minimize the number of accesses to the hard disk. Now, let's look at a simple bar chart. So, on the x-axis, there are three operations. One is the idle operation of the hard disk drive. The second is the read and the write operation. And third is the spin-up operation. On the y-axis, you have the power, which is generally measured in watts. So, what you can deduce from this uh, simple bar chart is that the spin-up operation takes up the most amount of power. And the idle operation takes up the least amount of power. So, in order to write good application programs, we need to ensure that the spin-up is kept to a minimum. Now, there were uh, certain experiments that were conducted uh, and recommendations were given so that we could use these recommendations in our application programs to minimize the movement of data. In the first experiment, uh, the setup was to read a really large file uh, and uh, measure the power, measure the energy that was consumed in each read operation. So, uh, they are taking a large file, which is basically 1 GB, and they are dividing that large file into equal sized blocks or chunks, okay, ranging from 1 bit to 64 bit. And each read operation, uh, the power consumed for each read operation was measured. Now, what was observed that as the block size increased, the CPU utilization and the energy consumed was actually lesser, thereby increasing the performance. So, if you're going to break up a 1 GB file into one bit or each and try to read it, um, it's going to consume a lot of power and uh, maximum CPU utilization will be there. But the recommendation was if you're going to divide your large file into block sizes of 8 KB or more and you're going to read it in blocks, then the power consumed is less. So, your application program, if your application program involves reading huge files, uh, then you need to ensure that the files are read in block sizes of 8 KB or greater. Let's move on to the second experiment. In the second experiment, uh, a concept called as NCQ, which is known as native command queuing is used. Let's first understand what is NCQ. NCQ is a technology which is used to increase the performance of your hard disk drive. Now, what it does, it leaves the decision uh, of read and write to the hard disk. Okay, suppose you have a lot of read and write operations in your application software. 
the order in which these read and write operations are to be executed are left to the decision of the hard disk drive and when this happens the hard disk drive actually optimizes the read and the write operations thereby using less energy leading to greater energy efficiency so what happens in this uh, setup is a 256 mb file is taken in both fragmented and unfragmented states now a fragmented file is one which is basically broken down into smaller parts and scattered all across your hard disk drive it is not stored in contiguous locations an unfragmented file is one in which the entire file is stored in a contiguous manner these files were read and then the results were basically compared what was observed is when the ncq the native command queuing technology was utilized the total time that was uh, needed to read this particular 256 mb file was reduced by 15% when compared to when ncq was not utilized so the recommendation uh, of this experiment was that whenever you have random io operations with multiple files then the native command queuing technology is to be used um let's move on to experiment number 3 now experiment number 3 decides whether buffering is necessary for multimedia playback we all use our smartphones and laptops to play multimedia right we listen to songs we watch movies we watch series um now this particular experiment measures whether that particular multimedia file is read uh uh when it is broken down into chunks and read and when it is buffered the entire file is buffered which um method provides better performance so an mp3 file which is of the size 4 mb is taken and it is read in two ways one it is broken down into equal 2 kb chunks and in the other method the entire file is buffered now buffer is a temporary storage okay and the entire file is read ahead and stored in the buffer for future use okay so there are two methods to read this file in the first method the 4 mb mb3 file is broken into equal sized chunks of 2 kb each in the second method the entire file is read and stored in a temporary location or the buffer which means it has been read ahead before it is actually used now what was the observation when the data was read in small chunks the hard disk is continuously active because you read 2 kb then you go back to the hard disk to read the next 2 kb so the data hard disk is continuously active and more power is consumed because it involves the spin up operation it involves the read and the write operation so more uh, power is consumed and it basically decreases the energy efficiency instead if we are going to read the entire file ahead and place it in the buffer okay the energy efficiency automatically increases so what was the recommendation the recommendation was that a buffering strategy when used with multimedia playback minimizes power consumption and saves energy okay so let's move on to experiment number 4 now the impact of fragmentation as i told you before a fragmented file is one which is broken down into pieces and scattered all across your hard disk and an unfragmented one uh, file is one which is stored in a contiguous location so um, uh, you all know that uh the energy cost to, to read a fragmented file is obviously greater than that of a contiguous file but again this was actually tested so they've taken a 256 mb file that was fragmented and a 256 mb file that was unfragmented and what was observed it obviously took longer and more power was consumed to read the fragmented file okay almost twice as long um so obviously the energy savings were also proportional so what was the recommendation that if your application program the program that you are going to design has to read fragmented files you defragment it using uh you defragment it using particular softwares before you actually read it and that is going to save a lot of energy and increase the energy efficiency that is about experiment number 4 let's move on to the final experiment which is experiment number 5 that is disk io in multi threaded code now we all know what is multi threading the process is broken down into 
individual independent threads that are capable of executing in parallel or capable of executing simultaneously. So for this particular experiment, uh, their setup was to convert a bitmap image to a JPEG image. And for this, they were using an algorithm based on IEJG library. Now, this library is basically used to convert a bitmap to a JPEG image. And um, there were three uh, tests that were conducted. In the first test, um, there was no multithreading concept, just a serial version of the application. Uh, in the serial uh, uh, ver version uh, was uh, used to convert the bitmap to the JPEG. In the second test, two threads were created and the work was distributed between these two threads that worked independently. So it split up the work and the two threads were working independently. In the third test, a third thread was added to these two threads to basically coordinate the read and the write operation. Okay, so in this setup, in multi-threading, um, they wanted to convert a bitmap image to a JPEG image using a library software. So there were three tests. In the first test, the bitmap image to the JPEG conversion was done serially. In the second, two threads were created that split up the work and that were capable of working independently. And in the third method, a third thread was added to the second test that basically coordinated the read and the write operation of the two threads that were initially created. Now, what was observed that in the first test, there was no improvement in any performance because it was serial conversion, correct? In the second and the third method, where two threads were created and three threads were created, there was significant improvement in performance. Uh, significant improvement in performance of the hard disk drive, significant improvement um, decreases power consumption, increases energy efficiency. So what was the recommendation for multiple threads competing for disk I.O.? Okay, you can also use NCQ, that is native command queuing, where in the, the technology which allows the hard disk drive to determine the order of executing the read and the write operations. So if the concept of multi-threading is used, then it leads to better performance. So if you as future software engineers are going to develop um, application programs, then you need to keep in mind as to how the software you develop will impact power consumption. One of the ways in which power consumption is impacted is the way in which your hard disk drive basically works. So the important points to uh, take away from this particular session is that uh, for data efficiency to be achieved, you need to minimize data movement. That is the movement to and fro from the hard disk to your processor. And uh, uh, all the five experiments, uh, you need, if you're going to read a large file, you need to break it down into chunks of 8 KB or more that increases performance. If you're doing a multimedia playback, then buffering increases performance. Multi-threaded mode increases performance. And um, NCQ using native command queuing technology improves the performance of the hard disk. Um, and um, and fragmentation. So whenever, if you're going to deal with fragmented files before you use it, you basically defragment it using a software. So that's all for today. Uh, thank you for listening in. Thank you.